The following is a paid presentation. The contents and claims are the sole responsibility of this sponsor and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of WTBR, CBS 6, local TV holdings, its employees, or subsidiaries. Recorded March 19th at Richmond's historic St. John's Church, this is A Governor's Conversation with Virginia's 71st Governor, Robert F. McDonnell. Virginia's first elected governor, Patrick Henry, as performed by Michael Wells, and moderated by University of Richmond President, Dr. Edward L. Ayers. In just a moment, the proceedings will commence. America is dotted with places of great historic importance. Places where America's founding generation fought for liberty. Liberty that came at a great cost to a young nation. And nowhere is the struggle for liberty more vivid than at historic St. John's Church. St. John's Church Foundation invites you to watch and listen as actors in historic costume reenact Patrick Henry's Give Me Liberty or Give Me Death speech at the Second Virginia Convention of 1775. Enjoy guided tours with costumed interpreters. Discover Richmond's first public cemetery Explore the permanent exhibition at the Visitor's Center and peruse the gift shop. St. John's Church Foundation, celebrating 75 years of bringing history to life. Employee-owned firm, we've been helping our clients make wise investment decisions since 1863. Using prudent investment strategies, we take pride in building lasting relationships that impact our clients' lives. Davenport and Company, 149 years in the investment business. That's a lot of experience. For quality investment advice, contact Davenport and Company today. Tune. I live in a room of fire. I live in a welding mall. I live in Richmond. Action! Tonight we have a, a narrow topic, um, which is what is the proper role of government under the United States Constitution? I think perhaps it would be useful if both governors uh, give our audience a, a sense of how you came to this place. Well, perhaps I should take precedence then, since I was indeed Virginia's first governor not appointed by a king. When I was first made governor in 1776, we were at war. Virginia had dominion over lands from the Atlantic Ocean to the Mississippi River and stretching up to the Great Lakes. We were the largest, the greatest populated, and probably the richest of the colonies. And, of course, we were the oldest. Now, since our capital at that time was in Williamsburg, I removed there and occupied the governor's mansion, which had been vacated so, uh, in so much haste by Lord Dunmore, the last of the royal governors, I served three consecutive one-year terms, the most that were allowed by Virginia law at the time, and turned the office over to Mr. Jefferson. I was also governor for two additional terms in 1784 and 1785, and I occupied the first governor's house in Richmond, a brick-ended frame house uh, that stood just adjacent to the present mansion. It was small in scale and not particularly comfortable, especially with my growing family, so I spent much of my time at Salisbury, in my home in Midlothian. Governor McDonald. Well, I'm Bob McDonald. I'm the 71st governor, and I moved here from Philadelphia in 1955, so I'm sort of a newcomer to uh, the Commonwealth of Virginia. But uh, what a treat to be here with the first governor, the second governor, the first president, 
and uh, the president of University of Richmond. It's really a, a treat, to, and thank you all for your great support for St. John's Church and uh, this marvelous rich tapestry of history that we have here in Virginia. Every time I come here, I get chills, uh, especially seeing Mr. Henry uh, do what he does uh, so well. Mr. Henry, you'd be glad to know that we still have that table from Scotchtown, your home, and I'm taking good care of it in the governor's office in the well, mansion now, so you'll be glad to know that. And that little shack you moved into on Capitol Hill, we tore it down. Uh, and, uh, good. good riddance. It, <laughs> but I still live in the oldest continuously occupied governor's mansion in America. It is now 200 years old uh, this year. Uh, the First Lady and her team have done a marvelous job restoring that, and I would say, as she's often said, it's not bad for 200-year-old public housing. And so we've, uh, <clears throat> we've enjoyed our time there very much. And I'd like to actually begin with a quote from General Washington, if I may. It is essential that you should practically bear in mind that towards the payment of debt, there must be revenue, that to have revenue, there must be taxes, and that no taxes can be devised which are not more or less inconvenient and unpleasant. <laughs> Some things endure. Governor Henry, perhaps you would like to begin with a comment. Well, we fought a revolution over the question of who has the right to tax us. One of the most important of the rights that we inherited from, from our British ancestors is the right to be taxed only by our own elected representatives. Those who we freeholders select to represent us in the House of Delegates know better than any foreign, uh, any distant central government how much we are able and willing to pay for the benefits of government to maintain post roads, harbors, courthouses, and other improvements as from time to time may be desired by the citizenry. The actions of the British Parliament in attempting to tax our people without our consent was the premier cause of the struggle to establish an American independent government. The federal constitution, the adoption of which I oppose without significant amendments, relies upon the unlimited power to tax the citizens of the states and not upon requisitions of funds from the state governments to the federal government, which is the mechanism that I would prefer. Let the state legislatures determine how best to raise the funds required for the federal treasury, I say. We ought to be exceedingly cautious in giving up this life, this soul of money, this power of taxation to Congress. At present, you buy too much and make too little to pay. Will this new system promote manufacturers, industry, and frugality? The evils that attend us lie in extravagance and want of industry and can only be removed by assiduity and economy. In this scheme of energetic government, the people will find two sets of tax gatherers, the state and the federal sheriffs. This, it seems to me, will pr produce such dreadful oppression as the people cannot possibly bear. The federal sheriff may commit what oppressions, make what distresses he pleases, and ruin you with impunity. For how are you to tie his hands? Have you any sufficiently decided means of preventing him from sucking your blood by speculations, <laughs> commissions, and fees? Thus, thousands of your people will be most shamefully robbed. I, I believe... You've set a high standard for forceful expression of your beliefs. Thank you, sir. Governor, I, I suspect that perhaps you have strong beliefs on this subject as well. I do, and I'm alarmed to say to Governor Henry that your worst fears, sir, have come true uh, <laughs> since did, you left I office. I did warn everyone. <laughs> <laughs> the concerns uh, expressed from the foundations of our nation are still ones that I hear from the citizens today, and that is uh, the need to keep the level of taxation to what is required for the provision of services that are authorized in the Constitution or in the statutes. The key, though, as I think Governor Henry properly pointed out, is that that taxing authority is John Marshall, the great Chief Justice from Virginia, as all the great people here have said, is the ta power to tax is the power to destroy. Very powerful in his uh, decision. Within the bounds of the statutes and Constitution, there is room for people like me and the legislature to determine within that scope of taxing authority. We generally have broad latitude as to 
what is the proper amount of tax. And it really comes down to, within that authority, what do you, the people, demand out of the society? If you demand better roads and highways and bridges and tunnels and mass transit and the like, then occasionally, every 27 years, there's additional <laughs> money uh, that is put uh, before the General Assembly for approval to provide that greater quality of life. That's what happened this year. So um, I think that the challenges that were founders faced uh, in some respect uh, with respect to the authority is still the one we face today, uh, but no doubt the demands from we the people uh, in order to perform that, uh, form that more perfect union, those demands are far greater than they were some 237 years ago. I, I would like now, if I could, to uh, quote our other distinguished visitor for the evening. Mr. Jefferson wrote this, whenever the people are well informed, they can be trusted with their own government. Governor McDonnell, what are your views on the importance of education in the Commonwealth? The Constitution of uh, Virginia uh, that uh, was also in large measure scripted by another of the founders, Mr. Mr. Madison, was uh, uh, amended many times. Uh, and one of the amendments uh, specifically says that the people of Virginia are entitled to a free, quality public education. That also has been litigated many times as to what the word quality means. But the fact that all people are entitled to it also, Dr. Ayers, as you know from civil rights times, has also been the subject of quite some, come some litigation. So we take uh, Mr. Henry and Mr. Jefferson's admonition quite seriously, and that is that uh, education is, uh, is fundamental to be able to create a ordered society, that providing uh, fellow citizens with uh, uh, as some have said, the, the minimum tools to be equipped to go out into society to be productive and functioning members is in fact a legitimate government good and a legitimate uh, government purpose. And so as a result of that, we spend about 45% or so of all the revenues that you taxpayers send us every two years, 85 billion or so. We spend about 45% of that on, uh, on education, about half on K-12 and about half on, uh, on higher ed, and because uh, I think most of us probably would not be in the positions of uh, responsibility and be here today, certainly I wouldn't as governor if I had not been, been blessed to have a fine uh, public and private education, both at the K-12 and, and university level. And so that obligation, I think, uh, continues, uh, continues for us today. Governor Henry. Well, I must confess that I have very little formal schooling. I had uh, some years in a local, uh, what we call an English school, and then, uh, then I had learning at home from my father, who had attended uh, university in uh, Aberdeen, Scotland. And uh, my father taught me um, the important subjects, mathematics, Greek, and Latin, but uh, no college of William and Mary for me. The gentleman uh, across the way has the advantage of me there. I, I read for the law on my own uh, and uh, passed the bar examination in Williamsburg. Uh, but as I like to tell my rural constituents, natural parts is better than all the book learning on the earth. But one must look to actions as well as words. I think you can judge my opinion of the importance of education in Virginia by the fact that in early November of 1775, I was elected as a founding trustee of Hampton Sydney College. I plan to continue as a trustee until my death. As a representative in the state legislature, I was instrumental in 1783 in achieving passage of the college's charter, and seven of my sons have or will soon attend the new college. I, I think we might want to leave the, the softballs behind and explore some rougher ground here. Uh, if you could please give us your opinions of our Constitution, and if you could include comments on the presidency and the <laughs> legislative branch and the Supreme Court. That would be high and inside. Uh, so, <laughs> Governor Henry. The power of the presidency. Besides the expenses of maintaining the Senate and the other house in as much splendor as they please, there is to be a great and mighty president with very extensive powers, the powers of a king. Your president may easily become king. He is to be supported in extravagant magnificence so that the whole of our property may be taken by this American government by laying what taxes it pleases, giving themselves what salaries they choose, and suspending our laws at their pleasure. A standing army we shall have, too, to execute the execrable commands of tyranny. 
If your American chief be a man of ambition and abilities, how easy it is to render himself absolute. The army is in his hands, and if he be a man of address, it will be attached to him, and it will be, subject to, it will be a subject of long meditation with him to seize the first auspicious moment to accomplish his design. And how are you to punish them? Will you order them to be punished? Who shall obey these orders? Will your mace bearer be a match for a disciplined regiment? In what situation are we to be? What will then become of you and your rights? Let us proceed to the role of the legislature. Your Senate is, in so, is so imperfectly constructed that your dearest rights may be sacrificed to what may be a small minority. And a very small minority may continue forever unchangeably this government, although horribly defective. I am not well versed in history, but I will submit to your recollection whether liberty has been destroyed most often by the licentiousness of the people or by the tyranny of the rulers. I imagine, sir, that you will find the balance on the side of tyranny. As to the role of the Supreme Court, honorable gentlemen have told us that these powers given to Congress are accompanied by a judiciary which will correct all error. On examination, you will find this very judiciary oppressively constructed and the judges dependent upon Congress. There will be some check as long as the judges are incorrupt. As long as they are upright, you may preserve your liberty. But what will the judges determine when the state and federal authority come to be contrasted? Will your liberty then be secure when the con congressional laws are declared paramount to the laws of your state and the judges are sworn to support them? If there be a real check intended to be left on Congress, it must be left in the state governments. Sir. So, Governor, I'm sure you noticed this is a rather stirring set of reservations about our Constitution and our entire form of government. I look forward to hearing your thoughts upon that. Well, and well placed, as 236 years have shown. <laughs> and uh, again, the concerns at the founding of the Republic are still ones that um, I think citizens uh, bear today. And, um, being able to ensure that the brilliant checks and balances that the founders crafted into the Constitution and ultimately into those first 10 amendments, the Bill of Rights, uh, that they be uh, zealously protected and defended by all, uh, all branches of government. There's been some things said about democracy, that it is the worst form of government, but for all others, which I think echoes Mr. Henry's rightful concerns about power being vested in failed human beings, but yet, there is no other system that's been created in the history of civilization that uh, does as well. And relying on the benevolent dictators has never worked out uh, throughout the course of history. The executive branch, which now happens to be my favorite branch, <coughs> is, um, is uh, one that I really like because I only need one vote to get anything done. So I love the executive branch. It's, um, <laughs> it's a real treat, although I am concerned about this um, this issue, uh, Governor Henry, of uh, the one-term governor. And with every passing day, I get more concerned about that since I'm down to 10 months. At least it wasn't one year. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, governor Henry had one year, uh, but he was re-up. I could succeed myself. That's right, he, and he could. He was one of only four governors that served multiple terms, although he was um, originally appointed and then was back uh, in 1785 when Mr. Jefferson's capital was uh, moved into, you were there for the foundation of the great uh, Virginia uh, state capital. So the executive branch is one in Virginia that uh, rightfully has a fair amount of power with a uh, line item uh, amendment, being able to propose a budget, having uh, very uh, broad uh, appointment uh, powers, about 4,000 people during a governor's term. And with a citizen legislature, as Mr. Uh, Jefferson and others thought was right, the legislature's only in town for 45 days in one year and 60 days in the next year. As I've said many times, there is no sight more beautiful than the taillights of the General Assembly leaving <laughs> Richmond at the end of the session. Because the liberty and prosperity of the people are never safe while the General Assembly is in session. Now, Mark Twain and Patrick Henry, I think, have said that to some degree over the years. Uh, the third thing I would say is the, uh, the role of the judicial uh, branch. I would also comment, uh, Governor Henry said something very important, as he said that the ultimate check on the power of Congress is, in fact, the states. Right. And he read, in part, his great concern about what would happen if people did not pay attention to the Tenth Amendment. 
which essentially says that anything that's not articulated in Article I, Section 8 of the United States Constitution is reserved to the states and the people, respectively, meaning that the reservoir of all power that's not enumerated is the people. Mr. Henry's great concern, and rightly so, is that if, it's not partic if those powers and rights are not particularized, then the reservoir of all unenumerated power becomes the government. And that was the great fear that led Mr. Henry to rightfully argue so passionately for the Bill of Rights. And so that was some of the great brilliance of the founders. Now, when it comes to the judiciary, uh, they have been called many times the least dangerous branch. Uh, one of the great purveyors of Anglo-American law that I know <coughs> Governor Henry and Governor Jefferson studied, and I think General Washington, was William Blackstone, who said that... Um, the role of the judiciary is solely to find and declare the law. In other words, not to make it up. They were supposed to seize the law put forth by the legislature, signed by the governor, merely find the applicable law to a case or controversy, and then declare what the law is, apply it to the facts of the case, render a decision. It seems to me that the executive and legislative branches still have a reasonable power upon one another, although and certainly in the Congress, they're able to do anything the Supreme Court says they can't do. The abuse of the Commerce Clause, clause uh, in the United States Constitution, I think, is a great case in point. And uh, recently, with the uh, Papaka decision, I think the taxing powers is probably another case in point. But I would think if there was one branch that might uh, use a little bit more uh, check and balance in, uh, in the modern era, and that would be the power of the judicial branch that oftentimes, uh, I believe, thinks that they have the further power to actually make the law. And the fact that in Virginia uh, we have a term of years certainly is better than having judges elected, which I think would cause the founders to roll in their grave because you see a lot of independence. I also think that the life tenure that was provided to federal judges creates yet another challenge. Yes, it gives you independence, but it gives you virtually no check and balance but for misfeasance in office and only a handful have been removed over the last 200 years. So. Uh, Never would I suggest tinkering with the uh, work of the founders, although it's been done about 29 times now uh, since uh, the original Constitution. But I, uh, I think it has been uh, an incredibly great system that, again, is the worst form of government but for all others. Well Talking about power devolving. In, in this particular context, all power devolves to the moderator since I have the microphone <laughs> in the middle of this. <laughs> and with the enormous power vested in me by myself, um, I would, would like you, Governor Henry, to make any closing remarks that you might like to make. Thank you, Doctor. The first thing that I have at heart is American liberty. The second is American Union. And I hope that the people of Virginia will endeavor to preserve that union. In the interest of preserving liberty, let us ally ourselves to virtue. Without that auxiliary, our appearance in the theater of nations will be fleeting, with it fixed as the firmament. No free government or the blessings of liberty can pre be preserved to any people but by a firm adherence to justice, moderation, temperance, frugality, and virtue. I ask that you remember this, and in thy sphere, practice virtue thyself and encourage it in others. Thank you. Well, I want to thank all of you for uh, coming and for your generosity in supporting this incredibly important uh, mission and ministry here at, uh, at St. John's Church. This is not just a building. This is, this is living history. Uh, the things that happened here in uh, 1775, 1776 truly changed the course of human history. <laughs> governors at the National Governors Association and uh, we talk about, you know, our states, and of course everybody's got the greatest state in the country, and I say, well, listen, Virginians have invented America in 1607. Henry and Jefferson were the first two governors of Virginia. What's your story? And it's a, you know, it's a great little icebreaker, and uh, <laughs> they generally don't have anything to say after that. So uh, I, like you, am incredibly honored to be just a small piece of, of the Virginia uh, story. I think we are greater than the sum of our parts and that all of us, whether we happen to have the privilege of being in elected office or uh, whether you are uh, an ordinary citizen, all of us have a remarkable role to play among our 8.2 million Virginians in preserving liberty and democracy. Uh, many have said that what's great about our country, it really isn't government. You know, de Tocqueville came here 150 years ago and tried to study why is this such a great country, even 50 years 
after, uh, after the birth of the Republic. And his conclusion was that the reason America was great is because she was essentially good and that there was these multiple acts of goodness and kindness and uh, sacrifice following the golden rule that Americans generally have embraced and adopted because of our faith tradition that has made America what it is. And so while these precepts and principles of government are very important uh, and the brilliance of the founders can never be overstated or fully understood how God allowed so many smart people to be in one place, in one church, at one time, to devise this country, that ultimately the strength of our republic and our country is, is we the people. It, it is all of us together. Everybody has an important role. Without a participatory democ democracy, our system is no good. And, and democracy has never been a spectator sport. These patriots that are here tonight were willing to literally you know, pledge their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor and most of them did. They, they, they either died or they gave up a lot of their fortunes, none of them their sacred honor, but they gave an immense amount uh, for this idea of liberty that Governor Henry spoke of so, uh, so eloquently. So I say as you leave here, first of all, thanks for keeping this living history alive so that the story of the things that happened here in this place will be told to our kids and our grandkids. It's vitally important. But secondly, that you take your role as citizens, very important, uh, because you're, you all, as the founder said, you all are the ultimate check on all branches of government. You all retain all power, uh, and you simply delegate it to legislators, governors, and ultimately, uh, and, and ultimately to this collective uh, government in order to do your will. And if you don't like what we do, throw us out. That's the ultimate power and the brilliance uh, of our founders, and as long as you take that seriously, Dr. Ayers, we'll continue to have a great America. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen. Here, here. A Governor's Conversation was recorded March 19th at Richmond's historic St. John's Church. To order your DVD copy of the entire unedited presentation, go to historicstjohnschurch.org or call 804-648-5015. DVDs are $15 plus shipping. A Governor's Conversation on DVD. Get your copy today of this historic discussion between Virginia governors. Go to historicstjohnschurch.org. owned firm, we've been helping our clients make wise investment decisions since 1863. Using prudent investment strategies, we take pride in building lasting relationships that impact our clients' lives. Davenport & Company, 149 years in the investment business. That's a lot of experience. For quality investment advice, contact Davenport & Company today. Additional consideration provided by RCM&D is a risk management and employee benefits consulting firm. Looking further, looking deeper. Special thanks to Dr. Edward L. Ayers, president of the University of Richmond, for moderating a governor's conversation. Mosman, Sisk, and Marvel Investment Group of Wells Fargo Advisors. Party Perfect, event and party rentals. Learn more at partyperfect.com.